Folks, welcome to another session of There's Just Something About Kansas City. I couldn't be happier than to have this great woman sitting right across from me, Brenda Tinnen. And for all those who do not know, Brenda started out at the, uh, I'm just going to say on, on the knees of your mom, okay? Uh, as a little girl, maybe your mom was the first original take your kid to work day mom, right? And you're selling tickets for the KC Scouts and the Kansas City A's, and then you just went on to become the driving force behind the success of the Sprint Center, and you have had a remarkable career. And thank you so much for uh, for coming in and joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, actually tell people I think my mother invented Take Your Daughter to Work Day, <laughs> and now there are laws against that child labor that she put me through out at the stadium. Yeah. But it was so much fun. Yeah, and, and, you, and you learned a lot. I mean, this is, I think it's very important when we talk about you to talk about your relationship and your mom doing that with you and then how much that influenced your career as you move forward, because you learned as a young girl, just a young kid, and you just came up in a world of adults dealing in business like this. And I think that really, really helped you, didn't it? And I know your mom was a tremendous influence. Oh, mother was definitely a tremendous influence. And her boss, too, at the time with the Kansas City Athletics, uh, was a woman, Gertrude McClure. And I think that maybe one of the two, few two women that were at the stadium at that time. And, of course, during the summers, I got to go out to the ballpark uh, once I got old enough to go out there. My grandfather, uh, James Luce, was uh, the security officer for the uh, club room for the home team. Right. So he would go late in the afternoon, and I would get dropped off and run up to the ticket office. And then uh, my mom would have errands for me to run and because nothing at that time we didn't have all the technology that right. we enjoy now. So if you had to take change out to gate seven or down to the <laughs> press box, it was here, Brenda, go run these out. And um, I think she really encouraged me. You know, she'd time me and say, oh, I think you could shave some time off of that. They need it a little <laughs> faster. So it did. I, uh, I think I knew that ballpark like the back of my hand. Yeah. Yeah. It's still there. It won't be for long, but it's still there for now. And it's, it went through some changes, obviously, but probably also somebody at, at the, at, at the ticket window going, you know, well, I brought a couple of extra guests. Can you think, and I'm sure you were then called upon to race the tickets down to the, uh, to the will call window, right? You're absolutely yeah. correct. There were no pneumatic tubes at that point. It was <laughs> Brenda down the steps around the corner and to the press window uh, to take the extra ticket da tickets down. Or, you know, the sellers would run out of change or, you know, sure. somebody needed something and I would just uh, run it. I had a blast. Yes. Yeah, so, so what happened when the A's left? Charlie O'Finley took them mm -hmm. and they left. And then, of course, um, you know, they, they ended up with, you know, uh, Muriel and and, uh, and and Ewing Kaufman. They needed Joe McGuff, of course, a great columnist of the Kansas City Star at that time, sports columnist, and trying to get n another team back here. What was the, the 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 lull in between the A's and the Royals? What was that like for you and, f and for your mom at that point? You know, it was really strange. That was the year Kansas City had no baseball. I think it was 1968 or 69. Yes, right in there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I remember that the majority of the boxes from the ticket office ended up in our basement. Uh, all of the records, of course, you know, no floppy oh, disk gosh, or no, yeah. no <laughs> thumb drive <laughs> to put it on. So all of those boxes of the season ticket holder information were sealed up and stored in our, our basement. and was just a very strange summer with, you know, no baseball in Kansas City. But there was talk. And we knew that um, Mr. Kaufman was trying to get a team here, and everybody was very hopeful. And when that happened, it's like everything went back out to the ballpark, and we started it all back up again. Wow, that's just incredible. And then did your mom continue on as well? Mother stayed point? on, yes, through um, – she stayed on until the Royals moved to the new stadium. Okay, yeah, and, yes. until they went to – which was then Royal Stadium at that point, before the K, yeah. Right, right, right to the Truman Sports Complex. Right. And then at that point, um, we were getting a new hockey team, an NHL team. The scouts were moving to Kansas City. 
Uh, Kemper Arena was under construction to be the home of the Kansas City uh, Scouts and the American Royals. So right. those two together filled that need. And mother was uh, working at the Continental Hotel. And that's where the Scouts had their offices. And they were doing their season ticket drive and uh, getting everybody signed up to be season ticket holders and, and open the new Kemper Arena. Right. Now, I, I could be in trouble because it, it sounds like you started working when you were, like you said, the child labor laws. You know, <laughs> you, you might have gotten mom in trouble here. But what was your life like on the outside besides that mom, dad, growing up in Kansas City? What was it like for you? I, you know, I think it was just great growing up in Kansas City. I couldn't imagine having a childhood anywhere else. I mean, obviously, it was great to be able to go out and run around the municipal stadium, the ballpark, and have that side of me. Mm -hmm. But I do have to tell you, I was the kid on our block that had all the baseball equipment, <laughs> and uh, we had a huge lot. So we would always have big softball games and baseball games in our, our backyard, um, all the kids in the neighborhood. It was just, it was a magic time yeah. then. You know, you just hopped on your bike and you were out all day and just be home by dark. And that was pretty much it. Yeah, we grew up in a golden time when you could do those things and everybody so worried, so hovering and whatever. The kids hardly can get out of the house or even want to. Half of them, they're on their screens or whatever. But then uh, what about school? I, I actually went to Oak Park High School, graduated there. I did not, I did not go on to college. I don't have... Uh, let's say, a formal degree. Mm -hmm. I think I have a pretty good degree in uh, sports life. and entertainment and marketing and life. In yeah. life. <laughs> um, but it was never, uh, you know, right then, it was right when Title IX came in. It was one of those things where, as a woman, unfortunately, you weren't really encouraged to go on to uh, get a secondary degree unless you wanted to be a teacher or a nurse or something, right. a skilled I should say, um, degree. And both my parents were uh, Marines. So, of course, they would, would have loved for me to join the Marine Corps, but sure. I felt like I had pretty much all my boot camp for all my formative <laughs> With mom years. and dad. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I really wasn't one that would do well in that structured environment mm -hmm. like that. So um, I just carried on. I, I never really made a conscious decision to go into the industry, but uh, with my mom and at Kemper Arena, and again, you know, we ticketing wasn't automated, so right. if a show came to town, you had to take the hard tickets out and deliver them to all wow. the outlets and count the tickets to all of the record shops, and they were the head shops at the time. And uh, they would sell tickets to the concerts or the circus or, or Disney on Ice or the Ice Capades and certainly um, the Scouts. And then ultimately the uh, Kings right. came to Kansas City. And I would deliver those tickets and then I'd take the loop around and pick them up, you know, the day before the game. Wow. So that was a lot. There was a lot of moving parts in that. Um, you know, you're delivering the tickets. They're accountable. Back then, you either had to have the hard ticket or the cash to pay for it. Right. We would do the settlement at each at each shop and then take the tickets back to Kemper Arena so they would all be available for the walk-up on the night of the show. Yeah, and you obviously had, you know, without the formal education and when we get start to go through your career, it's incredible what you've accomplished without the formal education. You, you, for, for all, of course, everybody thinks, oh, we got to graduate from college and maybe go to MBA school or, you know, w whatever we have to do. But what you did without that college degree, which I'm pretty sure you were pretty, I, I think you knew that I know what I'm doing. I've had great background with my mom and dad. You, you were never intimidated by any of this, which is incredible. You know, I really wasn't. When I was out at the ballpark running around as a kid, everybody treated me as my mother's name was Alma. They would call me Little Alma. You know, there's Little Alma, and they just treated me like an adult. And I even got to the point, back in the day in baseball, you would settle the game out with the um, traveling secretary, and they would come in and count the deadwood, the tickets that weren't sold, because, right. of course, the visiting team got a part of the gate. So... There was at that time where you had to spend a lot of time counting tickets that were not sold so the traveling secretary could see them. Right. So then eventually we had this great invention. It was called a tachometer. 
that actually was an automated ticket counter, very much like, you know, a change or a dollar bill counter. And I would go, you know, stand on the stool at the tachometer and run the tickets through <laughs> in bundles of 200 and and the traveling secretaries, I just got to know them and I'd put them up there and they'd just, you know, they knocked on them if they agreed with everything and then off we went. So, I mean, I did get to meet a lot, a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, you really did. I think one of the, the big things, you just never know, you know, when you get into a situation like this. Um, it, I, I think I'm going to go to, we'll go to 1981, okay, right in the area when the uh, when the Comets came to town and all of a sudden we got hit with the Liwicky brothers. Okay, Tracy, Tim, and Todd, right? All three of them. And who, don't forget Terry. And don't forget Terry, that's right. And then they went on to become who they were. But at that time with the comments, I can still remember the, and I'm, uh, I'm sure you're there because I was here, and we're sitting at, at the Kemp Arena, and I think it was Tim that stepped up to the microphone and said, this will be the last time you ever see this building empty. And they just hit town like a, like a, just an avalanche. They were they were incredible, weren't they? They were a force to be reckoned with. Yes, they and were. that moment that you were there that you're speaking of, I was at home and I saw it on television. I said, I've got to find a way to work for the Comets. And Mother at that point in time was still at Kemper Arena, I believe working for the uh, Kansas City Kings. Mm -hmm. Kings are still here. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh I said, Mother, how can I how can I get my resume into the Lie Wikis? I'd love to go to work for them. I just, you know, loved that enthusiasm of you're never going to see these seats right. empty again. And you know, he came through. They all came through with it because now I how it was filled sometimes was a little skeptical, but you know, because they gave a lot of tickets away, which was fine. They called papering the house a little bit, but they invited uh, youth soccer uh, teams, which was really smart. Great marketing. We're going to invite. Your youth soccer team to come in, and the head coach, one of the assistants, you get your tickets for free. But you want to bring mom and dad along, so now we're going to have to pay for the tickets now for mom and dad. Now you're going to have to pay for right. mom and you dad's tickets. You have to pay tickets. for something, yes. Right. Right. yes, and they also had the caravans that came from the different sports bars around the city, mm -hmm. and they would buy 30 or 40 um, tickets apiece, and then they uh, marketing, the bars would play one another at halftime, yeah. which... <laughs> You know, it's yeah. questionable. Uh, or some okay. of the minor league soccer teams would play one mm -hmm. another at halftime. So it was all about marketing the sport of soccer. Um, and, you know, Tim and Tracy and Terry and Todd all had big ideas. Right. I think they were very much. I, I really, they're way ahead. They're way More ahead. Yeah. I think as we see uh, sports and live entertainment and the marketing and the promotions and the sponsorship dollars, that that was really something that I believe was invented with the MISL and specifically mm -hmm. the Kansas City Comets and the Liwiki Brothers. Yeah. And, and it really brought soccer to the forefront here in Kansas City, too. And if you look at it now, these days, I mean, what we've gone through, of course, you know, we have both KC Current and we've got Sporting Kansas City, the pro teams, which is incredible. It's all right. But the, the infancy of soccer in this town that really started to blossom because I remember my boys played soccer. And we'd always go to St. Louis, and they'd just kill us. I mean, they, yeah. the St. Louis youth soccer kids would just run the Kansas City kids right out of the stadium, right? And then all of a sudden, the uh, Comets come to town, and all of a sudden you have all these. Now all of a sudden, parents are a lot more interested in getting my kids involved in this sport. And now it has just it, – it's been incredible. But that was the birth that was the infancy of really soccer developing in this city where the Liwiki brothers and the Kansas City Commons. I run into so many uh, people that are, you know, were of that era. And if I even mention the Comets, they say, oh, I remember going to those games and all their favorite moments. But then, you know, also what the Liwiki brothers did was during the off season for the Comets, we always had the Soccer Saturdays that we went out into each of the uh, city parks all around the region. Right. And they we had a Soccer Saturday. We had players with us. We had all of our sponsors with us. And we had the games beat the goalie and the defender. Sure. And I think they all learned a lot. And uh, I know the players loved it. Yeah. I 
I talk to a few of them here and there, Zoran Savick, and oh, I yeah. get together every once in a while. He has great memories of those soccer sure. Saturdays. But I really think you're right that this is the birthplace of Major League Soccer as we know it today in Kansas City. Yeah. It, I, I've heard that Kansas City's population of soccer players is the highest in the country, and I, I, I don't have the statistics to support that, but that's what people tell me. Right, and you could trace this all the way to 2026. We're now, we're going to have a World Cup. We're yeah. Have a World Cup. <laughs> we have, uh, you know, six World Cup matches here. Four, you know, preliminary matches and then, you know, quarter I mean, it's just unbelievable how this has morphed. But you could very well or easily trace it back to that time, so which was incredible. They were fun times, that's for sure. I mean, we were such a scrappy little staff. I used to always tell people, you know, when people say, what was it like to work for the Comets? I said, well, you had to do 12 things really good <laughs> because that's what it took to be part of that staff. Yeah. No, not just a master of all trades, but also uh, you're going to be master of all of them as well, not just master of none. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You yes. had to do it all. And you work for the Comets and then the, the uh, association and the relationship you have with the Lie Wikis then really helped you move along with your career. Because I think you, you left here 1988 and I think you went to Minnesota. You went to work for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Yes, so, yes. Which, if you know, think about this, folks, she's working, working for the Commons. All of a sudden, she's working NBA with the Minnesota Timberwolves. So. With the expansion team. An expa uh, another expansion team, you knew about that, worked with, with the Royals, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you had this, it wasn't an expansion team, it was a from-nothing team as far as, as the Commons were concerned, you know, brought up. It was. When nobody was talking about the MISL. But, no. And then you go to the Timberwolves and you knew exactly how to handle this kind of situation. It was, um, I remember the day I was sitting in my office at the Comets and I got a call from Tim and uh, he said, hey, have you ever considered leaving Kansas City? And I'm like, yeah, not once in my life yeah, right. I ever thought I, <laughs> I would leave Kansas City. And he said, well, we're, you know, we're building up the Minnesota Timberwolves at the team launches uh, and we're building Target, or it wasn't Target Center, we're building an arena at the same time and we need someone to come in and be head of the ticketing department. And I said, well, you know, I at the time, I'm married. I have three children. Yeah. I said, oh, it's probably a discussion I need to have. And I remember hanging out the phone, hanging up the phone. And I, now this is an odd, people won't know what your Rand McNally Atlas is, but I had to pull it out of my drawer and look on the map to see where the heck Minneapolis was. <laughs> it's like a lot of people that come that come to our city go, are you in Kansas? You're in Missouri. You right. know, one of those deals. Yeah. Right. So I did get a great opportunity to work uh, in Minneapolis from the ground up. I went there in 88, which was 18 months before the team was launched. Right. So we were there for um, the season ticket campaign, which at the time you had to have over 10,000 deposits on full season tickets before the NBA officially awarded the team. Um, you'll find this, I, I find it just jaw-dropping to know that the price of that team was $35 million. Oh, that gosh. was the franchise fee. <laughs> when you think about it, that, you know, the last team that sold, well, I guess the last team that sold was the Dallas team, but mm -hmm. Houston went for, uh, the Rockets went for $2.2 billion. billion. Yes, right. And I just am like, oh, my gosh. Uh, but so I went there, the Marvin Wolfenson and Harvey Ratner, two great, you know, philanthropic guys in the city of Minneapolis, and they loved basketball and wanted to bring the NBA back to Minnesota. Right. You remember the Lakers were there Lakers originally. Lakers were there, became the L.A. Lakers, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, um, and they just really had a vision for how they wanted to do things. They owned health clubs and apartments in mm -hmm. uh, Minneapolis and were very well known in the community and uh, wow. very well respected. And and we hit our 10,000. And the first year of the, uh, the first season the Timberwolves played, the arena was not complete yet, so we played at the Metrodome. You're playing in the Dome, right. Yes, and we still hold the attendance record for the season of over uh, 1.5 million. Wow. At first we said, okay, we're not going to sell more than 25,000 tickets per game. But then you know, Tim. 
He oh, looked yeah. around and saw all those empty seats. All the seats. empty seats with the drapes on them, right? They had the drapes around them, right? He said, well, I think we're going to expand out here a little bit. I think we're going to expand out here. And then we had heard that the Charlotte Hornets were on track to sell 900000 which they came into the league the year before we right. did. And, of course, all you have to do is lay down the gauntlet in front of Tim. And he said, okay, we're going to beat that record. And we opened everything up. And it was it was so much fun. So yeah, right. even though we only won 26 games that year, I think people came specifically to see the other teams. They came to see the Lakers. They they came to see Larry Bird. They came to see Magic Johnson. They came Michael to Jordan. And Michael Jordan yeah. and all the greats that we had at that time. So Yeah, it's funny because you probably look back on it because the Kings were here and left while you were uh, still working uh, down there for, for the Comets, and the Kings left the arena and you know was gone. It was empty at that point except for the Comets. And you, you saw what happened because if the Kings would have stuck around for just a little longer, they probably would have made it because that's when you know Bird and Jordan and Magic and everybody just exploded on the scene in the NBA. And I think they would have made yeah. it, but I, I – you know, someone yeah. offered them the money to sure. for Sacramento, and that's how it goes, I guess. Yeah, and then you move from the Timberwolves to the Houston Rockets, and uh, the the interesting story I know about the Houston Rockets, you told everybody in the front office, okay, here's your sledgehammer, here's your hard <laughs> hat, let's go, we got to go to work here, come on, you know. I thought I think that's great. Yeah. You know, it was pretty <laughs> funny. Um, so the Houston Rockets, we played at the Summit. Yeah. Um. And they had just won their first championship. And I don't think anybody prepared for the success. I walked into those offices, and they were still using rotary phones, which was really outdated at that point in time. Right. This is 1994, 1996. You're in Houston. So we're, yes. yeah, we're moving on at this yes. point. Yeah. So There's Houston, no receptionist wasn't. answering the phone. The oh, place wow. is just, I'm like, you know, people are wanting to get season tickets. We're not taking advantage of this. Right. So we did quickly put together, redesign kind of the office and put together what I always call a boiler room. That's where all the salespeople, <laughs> where we at least had people to answer the phone and answer questions from, you know, current season ticket holders to, you know, new season sure. ticket holders, because when you win, you know, that's the success is sometimes hard to handle if you don't plan for it. Sure. And they were behind the times, that's for sure. So you spent a couple of years there, tremendous success, by the way. And all of a sudden now, OK, uh, why don't I do something with the NHL? So it's, <laughs> it becomes a, you end up going to Phoenix with the Phoenix Coyotes. And it's, you know, I mean, I guess. In your business, it's all sort of the same, whether we're playing basketball or hockey, but all of a sudden you're playing hockey in the desert, okay, where yes. it's 122 degrees outside, yes. and you're trying to keep the ice solid inside. So Exactly. It, it was pretty interesting. After I left the Rockets, I did a little consulting. We came mm -hmm. back home. I did a little consulting, and I was uh, did the Calgary Flames had just moved into their new arena, the Saddle Dome, I think it is. Yes. It's not so new anymore. But uh, so I was up there. They were having troubles with their season ticket holders. So I went up, you know, they didn't like the new building. Nobody in hockey or baseball likes to change. They all like the, you know, the the culture of it. I went up and did some focus groups and kind of helped people get through that. And I'm in a meeting and I get this, you know, the secretary taps me on the shoulder and she says, um, you have an emergency phone call. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what what is going on? And I pick up the phone, and it's Sean Hunter. He was my intern in Minnesota. Oh, gosh. He's now been named president of the new <coughs> NHL team in Phoenix. He said, Brenda, I heard they're going to offer you a job in Calgary. Don't take it. I need you in Phoenix. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, can I call you back later? You yeah, know? right. And finished my presentation and then came back home. And they probably uh, did offer you a job, didn't they? Well, um, I left before they did. Oh, okay. You got out of, you got out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was never my intention to move to Canada. But, um, oh, right. Yes, yeah, so I came back, and then Sean called me, and he said, look, you know, the Winnipeg Jets are moving to Phoenix and I'm the only person on the ground here. Of wow. course, we had Jerry Colangelo. We were playing at the Suns uh, arena. arena. At the time, mm -hmm. it was the America West Arena. Um, and Sean said, and by the way, I'm getting married in February. So I need you down here right away. 
and uh, I'll be gone for like three weeks. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, I'll just leave you there to kind of get get things together, get, get to the know. manifest, yeah, sure. get to know everything, get to know what's going on with the arena. And he said, oh, by the way, some of the seats in here have a limited view because the America Pillars. West arena was uh, centered on basketball. Okay. So the center hung scoreboard oh, hung yeah. in the middle of the basketball court, which, as you know, the hockey sheet of ice is much longer. Yeah, longer. So mm -hmm. uh, I talked with Bob Machen, the general manager, and I said, hey, you know, when you have a down day, can we set up the dasher boards and can I just come out and kind of take a look at some of the limited view seats? Frank, <laughs> there turned out to be 4,987 of them. <laughs> But you know, you, but you weren't counting. I wasn't <laughs> counting. It's a number that still sticks with me today. Wow. I know. And I just thought, oh, well, this is going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. So we had kind of bounced some ideas off, you know, before I, you know, Sean's on his honeymoon. Hey, come back and guess what? One third of your arena can't, can't see the other goal. Yeah, right. Um, but they, uh, uh, the folks there at America West were great. They retrofitted with some televisions at that end. Um we called it the dog pound, is okay. what those seats were called. Get a little name, get, get yep. the fans there. They're all, yes. in, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. <laughs> um, we had special uh, marketing promotions that went on in that area of the arena. We worked with the radio station. But the funniest thing I have ever seen is watching the dog pound. As you see, the the hockey player coming down the ice to their end of the ice, and it's a breakaway, and they're watching, watching, watching. They get just past middle center ice, and everybody looks up at the TVs that are up here at the end. Because <laughs> <laughs> they can't see them at the other end. <laughs> can't see it. So it was just one of those things. I said, this is the weirdest thing. But, you know, every weekend we had a different band come in, and you, we do a promotion. If you throw me up a in bone, that area, up yeah. in that area. Sure. Alice Cooper was so great with us. He had Cooperstown right behind us, which was a big hockey hangout. Yeah. He was a big hockey fan, and he helped us with so many promotions. Right. But um, And then we continued when we made it to the playoffs. We continued the whiteout. Um, it was just fun because— yeah. They're a different fan, too. They are a different fan. There would be nights where I would see so many Red Wings jerseys, you know, in the dead of winter in Detroit. I, they were all in Phoenix. And it would just be like, oh, my gosh, you know, this is pretty disheartening. But the other thing was we outsold everybody in sweatshirts and lap blankets because people would come in from the 100 degrees <laughs> And it would be so cold because we'd have to keep to all them. The, it would be very cold. To yeah. them, it would be very mm -hmm. cold. So we would have to keep all the the <laughs> aisle curtains closed, to keep the humidity, and keep the ice as as cold as we could. The, that, that is called marketing. That is called marketing. <laughs> that is. We sold a lot of fleece. <laughs> right. Okay. So at, at that point, then you get done with the the Coyotes. We're now we're 99, 1999, getting ready to to change over the century, uh, the millennium. Um, and you go a couple of years and you go with AFG. That, I'm thinking that's Anschutz Financial Group, correct? It's AEG. AEG, I'm sorry. Anschutz Entertainment Group. Entertainment, Entertainment Group. Group, yeah. And it wasn't And you even, were senior VP, uh, VP for these, uh, for Anschutz, yeah, yeah. We weren't even AEG yet. It was LA Arena Corporation. Uh, we were just opening Staples Center. Okay. Uh, Tim was the president and CEO. Right. So there, he, there's, there's that relationship yeah. coming back. He probably had his eye on you the whole time, I'm sure. Well, you knowing know what? Tim. So when Mr. Anschutz bought the Kings and right. they played at the Forum, there would be times when Mr. Anschutz would want to see the Kings and and he would come to to Phoenix and say, hey, can I you know, come down? And Tim would call and say, hey, take care of Mr. and Mrs. Anschutz. And, of course, I would, you know. Um I mean, he's from Lawrence, Kansas. Why yeah, wouldn't Why I? wouldn't you? Absolutely. <laughs> and His name's he, on some buildings out there. Yes. They're very nice people, and mm -hmm. he'd come out Great and see the, see the games. I'd take them to the seats, get their dinner and everything. So I got to know them a little bit. Um, and then when my sales team, we, we had a uh, – for Phoenix, we had a marketing – promotion and if the sales team sold out six right. games in a row I took them all to LA to see the Kings game at the forum which in my mind the forum was like 
It was Showtime, the yeah. fabulous forum. And I went in Those there. Those all the, were all the celebrities would be sitting right yeah. courtside. That's where I think a lot of other teams got the idea. Well, that's a good idea. It was well, a Knicks good idea. Knicks end up with Spike Lee sitting on, yes. the, on the floor and the whole thing, yeah. But the forum was kind of old and dilapidated. Mm-hmm. And that was early on in my time in, in Phoenix. And then uh, Tim, had, we'd stayed in touch. And he said, well, they were building a building in downtown Los Angeles and Oh, that's great. And I still was with the Coyotes having fun. And then he he called and he said, you know, uh, would you be interested in Los Angeles? So he had already, the Lakers were part of the deal and the Kings, but then he had convinced the L.A. Clippers to also be part of the deal. This was later on. Right. Uh, But they were playing at the L.A. Sports Arena, which was in a very bad part of town and very dilapidated at that point. So then he had the three teams, but they also had uh, arena football with Casey Wasserman. And then they also had, uh, ultimately, we had the L.A. Sparks. So we had five team tenants. Wow. uh, Scheduling nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Just trying to send dates to the league. Whew. I was not their favorite person because I had I controlled the calendar. But um, so the arena was opening in October, and I spoke to Tim in August of 99, and we finally worked things out. And uh, he said, when can you be here? And I said, probably in about three weeks. And he goes, well, I need you here Thursday morning at 7 a.m. We're doing a walkthrough. And I threw everything in the back of my car in Phoenix and drove to L.A. Wow. And what a building. I mean, amazing. It was spectacular. And they had already booked the um, 2000 Democratic National Convention. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Grammys had committed to doing their shows there. Uh, We had, they had already put the opening night, Bruce Springsteen on sale. So I kind of came into, okay, the building's almost done. um, And it, it just was a lot. I mean, it's over a million square feet. Uh, so to learn that building and kind of get to know who all the players were at the building and then try to figure out, you know, the city of Los Angeles and navigate that as well. Yeah, right. Yes, it was huge. But that was just the first step. And then shortly after that, um, they started building the uh, Home Depot Center, which mm-hmm. is, you know, I think at the time Mr. Anschutz owned five of the of the soccer teams in yeah. the league. Mm-hmm. and. And the Hunts owned the other two, and Mm -hmm. Kraft owned the other one. So they built the Home Depot Center, and then we opened the Kodak Theater. And then we were talking to Celine about doing her uh, residency in Las Vegas. So, you know, and you talk about AEG's facilities department today. Back then, it was just myself and my counterpart, Lee Zeidman. I said, do you realize we're the entire facilities department for (laughs) for these six facilities? Of course, we had great staffs. And then we opened the building or bought the building in Dallas. Um, It's a theater there. And it just grew from there. AEG Presents. But it was just amazing. And, yes, you are correct. If you want to see stars in Los Angeles, just go to a Laker game, a Clicker, Clipper game, or a Kings game, and they're all there. They're all there. Just yeah, it's it's just incredible. So we're going to transition now. Now all of a sudden, you're uh, tell me how it came about for you to end up being the general manager of the Sprint Center. And I know you got a lot of kickback because you're in Los Angeles. You have this million square foot building. You've got all the stars. Everything's running beautifully, and all of a sudden. They say, okay, you go into some, you have to go into someone and say, you know what? I think I'm going back to Kansas City. How did that all transpire? And I know you got a lot of kickback about you, you're committing career suicide at that point. Boy, did I. <laughs> right. Career suicide was it. You know, it's pretty interesting. My family and I always came back to Kansas City when, when we had downtime or, or vacation time. 
We usually came in August because we could catch a Chiefs preseason game. We could see the Royals. We could go to Oceans of Fun and Worlds of Fun and take the kids and have all the family time, see all the grandparents, aunts, and uncles. And so I always watched what was going on in Kansas City, and I'd hear, oh, new arena. Oh, then it wasn't. Oh, yeah, I know. then new arena. Oh, then it and wasn't. And you remember the old Kemper. I do. So you certainly weren't coming back to go to that. I'll guarantee no, you that no. much. And I would talk to Tim because he still loves Kansas City. Mm -hmm. I'd say, what do you think those chances are? And he said, he would always tell me, I don't think they'll get it. I don't think they'll get it. And then um, Tim got a call from Mayor Barnes, who he had known because she was councilwoman when he was with the Comets. And right. Mm -hmm. So they had known one another, and she had talked to him about wanting to uh, get a new arena for Kansas City and talked about several locations and Tim said, well, you know, if you want to bring your, your crew out, you know, I'll give you a tour, Staples Center, of what we've done. Tim had worked with Wayne Cawthon, who was business manager in Denver, and then, of course, he knew Herb Kahn right. because Herb was part of the Comets group. When yeah, they the came original to town. group. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they all came out, and um, they were getting ready to take a tour, and Tim said, well, you know, Brenda will give you a tour. She's from Kansas City. So I just got to know them and gave mm -hmm. them the— the three-hour tour of Staples Center, and you still don't get to see everything by that point. Right. And then they had some talks about what they were trying to do. And I know Tim at that point was in the expansion mode for mm -hmm. AEG and thought, well, you know, what about Kansas City? Um, and sure enough, Mayor Barnes and her crew come out several times. They um, to take a tour, and then they were taking a tour of Home Depot Center, and they came to the opening night there. So mm -hmm. they were out several times, and I would always give them a tour, take them to the suite or wherever they were going, you know, because I always loved to hear what was going on in Kansas oh, City. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and so we did that, and then Tim had said, you know, I think we're going we're gonna to do this deal, but it has to pass the vote. Right. And thank you, St. Louis. And Enterprise rent a car. Yes. And the vote passed. We, uh, Tim and our crew and our media crew flew out on the day of the vote. We worked, we stayed, we weren't right at the door. We stayed away from the polling stations, but it was just amazing. All you had to do was say the word comets and people were like, oh yeah. You know, we I remember know, him. I, yeah, I remember, I remember that the, guy. Yeah. I, we know who you are. And right. the vote, the vote passed. And then it kind of was in my mind of like, wow. I wonder, should I go it's home? It's my hometown, doggone it. It's my hometown. I am an only child. My mother, my father had passed away. My mother's here on her own. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know, maybe the stars are aligning. But then I go back to L.A. and it's like, oh, man, you know. <laughs> weather. Yeah, weather. This <laughs> million, is glitzy. Million square foot building. The Lakers are winning. The right. Kings are winning. The Clippers are the Clippers. Yeah. But they're exciting. You know, there's just so much going on there. But then I thought about it, and um, I actually think it was really Kay Barnes who had already in her mind decided it was going to be me, unbeknownst to me. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, she told us that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, Brenda was going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she was going to do it. Yeah, there was no way I could tell her no. Right. I know. And she just had uh, this huge vision, and, you know, I came back, and I really— I really thought, you know what, the Power and Light District, you know, Kansas City's stepping up. They're spending, you know, four to six billion dollars on this. Union Station was, you know, kind of chugging along yeah, at that right. point. It had a renovation. It was doing well. And I thought, well, you know, things are, are getting more up to date in Kansas City. But I did get a lot of pushback from people I worked with in L.A., promoters and Everybody that I, you know, met with sure. of all the places that I oversaw, and they'd say, "Oh man, Kansas City!" You know, not only did I hear career Where suicide, is Kansas City? <laughs> yeah, I had to say it's in Missouri, it's yeah, not right. in Kansas. And then, oh, that's flyover country. Yeah. And one promoter said, "Oh, that's glaze over country. You'll never that building will never be a success." And wow. what team is going to play there? And so it was kind of eaten away at me a little bit. Sure was. But it, then I just thought, uh-uh, <laughs> not here in my hometown. Not my hometown. And, and I don't think it would have been 
you know, and I'm going to say this because you probably won't, it would not been nearly as successful with somebody who did not know this area and did not know the city. Because the other bottom line is there was going to be no NHL team and no NBA team. So you're going to have to fill these nights. You're going to have to do something and attract people to this glaze over, fly over country to come and do concerts there or whatever. And it was it was going to take a driving force that believed in Kansas City and believed this could work to get this done and what has happened with the arena, which is one of the most successful arenas in the entire country, whether they have an, an NBA or an NHL team or not. So it has been incredible. Sprint Center or T-Mobile Center has been a great success and a great public-private partnership uh, with AEG and the city of Kansas City. Um, I do believe, I will tell you, when the Seattle Sonics were getting courted to move to uh, Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. I did have some T-shirts made, and I got put together a big box of barbecue sauce and all the things that Kansas City is great for, and I sent um, the owner a letter that, the person, I can't recall his name right now, that bought the team and moved them to Oklahoma City. And I said, hey, take a look at Kansas City. You know, we have all of this. And it was probably two weeks later, I got a cease and desist letter from Commissioner Stern. <laughs> and I thought... Quit meddling. Yes, quit meddling. We have this deal done. But it was just like, oh, well, you can't blame a girl for trying. Man, yeah, that's... Yeah. Yes, yeah, just incredible. So Sprint Center... You decide you make you take the plunge, okay? And I know you were coming home, and I know you believed you were going to make it successful. And I think um, Elton John was not on tour at that time, but you wanted a big name, uh, uh, first concert, big name, huge name. We're going to show you what we're going to do. We'll talk about Garth Brooks here in a minute, but. Elton John was not on tour at that time, and so I think everybody said, well, yeah, I think his people were probably tell Tell that story about, well, yeah, but he's not on tour. Well, that was Garth, actually. <laughs> oh, that was wasn't Garth on tour. on tour yet. Okay. I um, Howard Rose, who is uh, Elton John's promoter, okay. mm -hmm. uh, when he was one of the people that told me this was career suicide to come back here, and I had said to him, yeah, but you're going to have Elton open the, open the building, <laughs> right? And um, he said, you know, we've played every building in Kansas City. We've played veterans. We've played municipal. We've played Kemper. They played, the, uh, they played at Kaufman. Mm -hmm. And he said, so if there's a new building, Elton will play it. And just kind of told me that. And I had worked with um, Howard. I got to present Pavarotti for, um, at Staples Center. Yes. And Howard did that with his friend, uh, Jerry Perincio, uh, as a fundraiser for the L.A. Opera. Right. And I think, you know, Howard said to me, you know, you say what you're going to do when you do it. And I said, please open the building. And so he did. Yeah. But with Garth, when I knew I was coming to Kansas City, it was funny. There was a little hole in the wall across the street from Staples Center where I used to go think and uh, maybe have an adult beverage or two. No, no. Yes, yes, I've been known to do that. You weren't under any stress. Why'd you need, <laughs> why'd you need a drink? Yes. <laughs> uh, my son was working there at the time, Wyatt, and my good friend Larry Chu, and they came over and they said, hey, we heard you're probably, you're going to Kansas City. Oh, you know, that's so great, that's so great. Who's going to be your first act? And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, I would really like to have Garth Brooks. And they both said to me, well, I thought he retired, you know. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, but he's the perfect guy. So keep in mind, that was in 05. Yes. So people kept asking me, and I kept saying I would like to get Garth Brooks. And so as we were getting closer, and I would call my promoter friends or whatever, and they'd say, oh, he's not on tour. He's not touring. He's not going out again until the kids are out, his yeah. children are mm -hmm. out of school. And I said, well, okay, I'm not asking him to tour. I just want him to play a show in Kansas City. Bring the whole family up to yes. KC. We'll put you up. We'll be fine. <laughs> exactly. So um, it was just really strange. Every door I knocked on, I couldn't get my foot in the door, door in the face every time. And I finally uh, got to talk to Randy Phillips. He was with AEG. And he said, here, I'm going to give you a name in Nashville. You call Steve Moore. He's on the board at the Academy of Country Music. And he knows Bob who um, who books Garth. Mm -hmm. And so I called Steve, and he just laughed at me. 
And he said, you're crazy. You know, I said, well, I, I am one of those crazy little women from Kansas City. <laughs> he said, well, I'm going to, to a ACM dinner tonight. I'll see Bob and I'll embarrass myself and ask him. I said, you know, I just want to hear Garth say, no, he's not going to do it. Right. And when Steve ran into Bob, it worked out. He said, well, Garth owes has a concert coming up that Walmart, who was his sponsor mm -hmm. at the time, wants him to do. And they said it could either be in Kansas City or in, I forget the, the city in Arkansas. No, uh, Bentonville. Bentonville, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, at the college, but the college did not at that time. Oh, allow Fayetteville. Them. Okay, at the Fay University of Arkansas. Okay, Fayetteville. I'm thinking of Bentonville with Walmart. <laughs> yeah, okay, it was okay. Fayetteville. Right. But the university did not, they only used the stadium for football. No, they did not do rock shows in there or oh, country wow. shows. So that kind of percolated for a while. Steve called me the next morning. He said, you know, you are some kind of gypsy or something. I don't know how you gypsied this up. But he said, I, I, I think we got our foot in the door. And, of course, it all kind of uh, came together after that. Right. Uh, the one thing I do know for sure is finally in about August, I get a call from uh, Garth's promoter, and he said, Garth wants to come up and see the building. You can't tell anybody he's coming. I said, okay, you know, let me know. When he's going to be here, I'll send a car to pick him up. Well, of course, Garth comes. He's got his big yeah. Oklahoma orange sweatshirt it, it's on. It's Garth, yeah. That's Garth, Garth. Garth. Yeah. <laughs> and he comes up, and we go, we, we're talking, you know, and he's taking notes, and he said he wanted to go walk through the building. And I said, well, you now, Ben, your promoter, told me that you couldn't be seen by anybody. And he said, oh, well, you know, I'll just kind of blend in, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not going to happen. But So we take him down, and we go into the building through the loading dock, and I said, kind of stay up, back up against the wall. And this is when we have the peak number of construction yeah, workers. Yeah, they're all working. They're all working. Garth walks in. He goes, oh, this is, wow, great building. It feels cozy. Look at this. The seats weren't in yet. Mm -hmm. He walks right out into the middle of the arena. <laughs> Everything stops. The, and no more construction is going on. You can just see that all the workers are pouring down onto the arena floor. And they were asking him, are you going to do a show here? He said, no, I'm just, you know, Brenda wanted my advice on some of the building, how it looks. And he took a photo or signed, he signed construction hats. He said, you can't tell anybody I'm here. <laughs> You can't tell anybody I'm here. And they said, oh, no, we won't. We won't. But we hope you come and play the building. I yeah. mean, they just showed him so much love and respect. Mm -hmm. And so I think, okay, this is going to – well, keep in mind there wasn't much social media then. Right, exactly. I think it was MySpace. We didn't even have Facebook yet. Right. But um, I thought this is going to get out. So then we take him back over to our offices. I'm having – the car pull around, take him back to the airport. And this guy is walking down the street, kind of a, he looked like he didn't belong there right. kind of guy, not mm -hmm. a country guy. And he looks up, he goes, you look just like Garth Brooks. <laughs> and Garth goes over and just puts his arm around him and they walk out in the street. And I don't know what he told the guy. And he said, thank you, man. And Garth gets in the car and goes and um, it was a couple days later. He said, well, do you think I can sell out one show? <laughs> and I said, he said, I haven't been out there in a while. No, people have forgotten about me. Sure. And I said, well, can we commit to more than one? I know you can sell out one, but what's the most you will do? And he said, six, and we sold out nine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it helped him because he was just then getting back into touring, correct? Uh, they didn't that kick it off? It, it, it unless did. I'm wrong, right? He had not played. He had never played a show in front of his children. Oh my gosh! So he brought them. Oh, that's awesome. Each one of them got a night on the weekend, and they got to bring all of their friends with them. Wow! And see Garth on stage, which it was just so unbelievable. It was unbelievable. He saw yeah. every one of those shows, and it helped him kick off his tour because he got to practice, too. It's a little bit like, the only thing I can compare it to is Michael Jackson for his thriller was at Arrowhead. Mm 
Right. And he did the two. He did the two shows at Arrowhead. But he even said when he came, "Yeah, I'm just starting the tour, so I'm going to get all the kinks out, and we'll get the kinks out in in." Kansas City will work on it. We do the two shows, and then we'll go worldwide at that point. That was what that reminded me of when Garth decided to do his do his thing. Well, and I, I will tell you that I think it did help him a lot. You know, Kansas City, I you couldn't have done that show in L.A. No. The, uh, nothing against L.A. audiences, but if you're there for a concert, most of the people in the audience are industry related, some way or somehow, or they're VIPs. And I always said, "Oh, they do the golf clap." Mm-hmm. You know, nobody. They sit on their hands a lot. No, <laughs> and everybody's dressed in black, and no one's you know screaming at the top of their lungs. And it was so refreshing to come back to Kansas City and go to a live event and see that the audience was so appreciative of every note and every song. Singing every song. Yes. <laughs> it's interesting when we had Fleetwood Mac, and they needed to get out of here in a hurry, so I had a traffic detail take them down to uh, Wheeler Airport. Mm-hmm. And so before they were getting on the plane, they were kind of all there talking, and uh, Stevie Nicks said, God, this is the best crowd we've had in a long time, they were just so into it. And so, of course, um, the police officer came back and he said, I just want you to know, Brenda, they felt that tonight was really special. Yeah. They were talking yeah. about how great it was. Right. And Garth, even before he kicked off, I guess he came for the ribbon cutting? He did. For, for the arena, which he just called him phone. Hey, yeah, I think I'll I'll be there for the ribbon cut. I Well, I told him everything that, it was go, that was going on and just kept, I mean, I think I talked to him like every other day. He just wanted to make sure it was right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure we presented him right. And I told him we had the ribbon cutting coming up and we had the symphony was going to be there. And, you know, and um, he said, well, do you mind if I cut up, come up? And I was like, well, come on. (laughs) And then he announced that on the final night that he was going to go worldwide in uh, Mr. Anschutz theaters. So we were in, he was in over 300 movie theaters um, across the U.S. and in London and some in Canada. Right. Yeah. Because he owned all the movie theaters, so he just piped them in there live, mm-hmm. yeah, which is just. And it was great. That, yeah. that is just incredible, yeah. It was a great night for Kansas City. Oh, it was an incredible night for Kansas City. That whole concert time was incredible. Because then the P&L really got seen by more and more people as well as it was, you know, putting itself together and doing all that. Yes. So, right across the street, which has become a staple now for virtually anybody that comes or for a Chiefs game or Royals playoff game or, you know, whatever, MLS game or whatever. That living got. room over there the is amazing. Right. I love when I'm watching World Cup yes. soccer and yes. they're having a watch party. They always cut back to Kansas City. And I'm like, guys – this is what it's about. I mean, because this is great marketing for Kansas City. We right. could not buy that kind of coverage yeah, to that right. many people. Okay, so you've you've gone through all this, and we talked about the fact you do not have a college education, which didn't matter, okay, because of just your work ethic and what you learned from your mom and just being around in these arenas and learning on the job for all practical purposes. Did you ever get any pushback in what – in those days, was a very male-oriented world. Did you? And I know you, you're laughing, but did how much pushback did you get as you were coming up? Now, as you had success, obviously they're looking at you a little bit differently. But as you were coming up, how much pushback did you get? Well, you know what, Frank? I if I went to any industry conference, I never had to wait in line for the ladies' room. <laughs> I thought, this is a huge plus. There would be one or two or three of us who'd be like, oh, hey, Donna, hi, Claire, you know, okay, it's us. I I didn't really, I think the most pushback I got was my my first um, trip to Minneapolis when I met with Marvin and Harvey, uh, the owners of the Minnesota Timberwolves, Mm -hmm. and and Bob Stein, who, by the way, uh, was a Kansas City chief on the 1969 uh, Chief yes, Super Bowl. He, yes, he was. He yeah. was my boss and president of the Timberwolves at the time. Uh, so talk about connections. Yeah, right. But th- that was the most pushback I got because uh, Marvin and Harvey, being of a older generation, and certainly in 1988, not too many oh. women no. moved their family. 
And so they were very concerned that I was uprooting my husband along with three children. Uh, they made sure, you know, okay, well, what does your husband do? Well, he's kind of in the arena business too. Okay, we want to make sure he gets a good job here. And here's the schools we think you should, sure. you know. This is the neighborhood you live in. Here's the schools. Yes, yeah. but they were just great. I sure. mean, once they kind of got over it, um, I will tell you that um, those two wonderful gentlemen came to see me in every city that oh, it, wow. when the Timberwolves were playing mm -hmm. in that city, they would call me and say, we're in town, let's go to dinner. And so I just stayed um, in right. touch with them. And it was great. And, the you know, they would always tell me how proud they were of me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, they just yeah. loved it. Did I get pushback? You know, I sure got some remarks here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, um, I thought this person was my mentor, but... When I was in Minnesota, I said, man, there's a general manager's job in this arena. And I said it to the pr promoter that I love him still today. I said, I think I'm going to go apply for that. And he looked at me. He said, Brenda, you're a woman and you're not even <laughs> Jewish. <laughs> and I said, well, thanks, Randy. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> thanks. You don't think I could do it? And he said, I think you could do it in a heartbeat, but they won't even look at you. Mm -hmm. And I said, and he, and he did say, I know you can't take rejection very well. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he also came to see me in most of the other cities yeah, I, right. I worked in as well. But, you know, it kind of made me sit back and think about it a little bit that you do, you like to think there's no difference, mm -hmm. but there is. And I, you know, I, I wasn't going to force myself into anything, sure. but I always felt like, I needed to do, I had to have a wow factor to stand out to let people know I could hold my own. Yeah, right. But, you know, I don't need you to, and I did get asked a lot in meetings to get coffee, which I did. I never said, oh, that's not my job. Because right. in, my, <laughs> in my position, it was always my job. I wouldn't ask someone else to do something I wasn't going to do myself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons my husband will never take me to any more live events because <laughs> I have this terrible <laughs> disease of if I see trash laying on the walkway, I bend over and pick it up. And right. he's like, this is not your building. I know. I know, but it's Kansas City. I mean, yeah. I just do it because that's yeah. that's what you do. Yeah, and I, and I think that goes full circle back to your mom because you wanted every place that you were in to be pristine, just mm -hmm. like her home. So, and that goes back to the military background as well. Okay, you know, uh, uh, the, um, oh, doggone, what do they call it when they make the bed? Um, oh, oh the, yeah. The, you can bounce a quarter yes. off, off of the sheets, yeah. Uh, and, and just everything is in its place. Everything is taken care of. And I think that's, it goes all the way back to, to mom. It, it does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She, um, yeah. And she always said, well, how can we do this faster? Back in the day when you had to collate season tickets, mm -hmm. the tickets just came in individual games, section row seat number. So if you had a season ticket, you had to get, get that them all and line them up, and then you go through <laughs> and count them and make sure you had all 82. Then you had to do seats two, three, and four right. and put them in bundles. And right. that, I mean, because she's like, well, you know your numbers. Just come and match this up. Right, sure. So I would do that, and she would say, how can we do this faster? Or... Oh, and we had to put labels on the envelopes. Yeah. She would say, oh, that label's crooked. Yeah. Gee, sorry, Mom. <laughs> yeah. That's the 9,000th envelope I've done today. <laughs> yes. I don't care if I put that thing right. Yeah. But, yeah, you kind of do learn sure. that regimented sure. kind of. Yeah. It, And I think it is the very basic knowledge. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to people that want to get in the industry. So I was going to ask you, yes. Well, you know, now, and even if I had gone to school, to a secondary, to a college, they didn't offer sports and entertainment marketing that, exactly. or hospitality mm -hmm. at that point in time. Nope. But now there are many of those those opportunities on various curriculum. So most people, you know, they take the sports marketing or the, you mm -hmm. know, entertainment and and then they even the hotel, the hotel ho business, hospitality. yeah, right. hospitality business. Yes. Yeah. So when I'm mentoring those people. I just say, you know, the first place you need to stop if you can get an internship is in the ticket office because it does touch every single division. 
whether it's the building, whether it's the players, whether right. it's the marketing, whether it's counting, it touches everything that goes on during that event. Right. And if you have a basic knowledge of how that comes together, you will find your way through that process right. much better. Yeah, bottom up. Yes. Plus, you do get to meet. Mm-hmm. You do get to meet who who's buying the tickets, and that tells you a lot too. Yeah. So, uh, and I said, you just have to, you have to ask a lot of questions. If people tell you, okay, you know, stack these peas this tall, ask them why you're doing it and what is the benefit of doing it. Right. So that you have that knowledge and you can put it all together. Yeah. And so just follow an order, just find out exactly what is in your brain here as we're doing this. Talk a little bit about your family. (laughs) <laughs> We've talked about everything else. I mean, my God, they've been everywhere. <laughs> they've been, come on, let's go. Well, we're going to Minneapolis. No, nope, come on, we're going to Arizona. You know, it's pretty funny. My kids used to joke about the fact that if you didn't have a ticket, you couldn't sit down at the Thanksgiving table. <laughs> and oddly enough, they would get their crayons out and make little tickets and little name tags and all that kind of stuff and, and put it together. But um, my three children are great. Minneapolis, they went to the box office with me as well, they would just be, like your mom took, took just you, yeah, yeah. I figured, you know what? In this industry, I people, I always tell people it is not a career; it's a lifestyle. Because when everyone else is having their Friday night, Saturday night, or Sunday, that's the best time to do events. Or you know, you do events. I can't tell you how many Christmas days I worked oh, yeah. um, in the NBA. I said, so you kind of have to wrap your head around that. And by the way, you don't get to stand out there and watch the game. No, right. You're working. Yeah, you you are working, and your eyes need to be forward and seeing what's going on around you. So that's one of the, I think, most difficult things for um, young adults getting into the industry. Because from out here, it looks all glitzy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You must get to meet so many people. Well... I, I do get to meet them, and it's fun, and they're great, but they're there doing their job, and I respect them enough to stay out of their way right. and let them do their job so we have a great event. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of autographing everybody, you know, oh, God, God, you know, and you yeah. sort of, um, you know, if they want to give you an autograph, great. I'm sure you don't hound them. You never have. Mm-mm. You just let them do their own thing. Let them yeah. do their own thing and feel comfortable. Yeah. But the funny one of the funny stories uh, about my middle daughter, Ari, and all uh, two of my children were in L.A. at the same time that I was there. Um, and I'll never forget, I finally got the Rolling Stones to come to, to Staples Center. Oddly enough, it was on Halloween, which I thought, oh, this That's is perfect. Yeah, this is <laughs> perfect. Perfect. perfect for the group. <laughs> uh, and I, my condo and Ari lived in the same building, was two blocks away. And um, the promoter said, hey, do you have anybody you want to bring the show? I'm not going to use these tickets, which rarely happens, especially in L.A. And I said, no. I said, well, let me make a call. So I call Ari, who's never seen the Rolling Stones in, in live. I said, hey, Ari, would you like to come see the Rolling Stones tonight? Because I have two free tickets. She said, oh, Mom, I've got the cutest costume. <laughs> I'm going out as the devil, and we're going to go to a club here. And I said, you know, I rarely ask you to make a command performance, but this is Mick Jagger and this the Rolling Stones. Yeah, this is a big I deal. I said, you can wear your costume over here, uh, but, you know, you can go out afterwards. So she did come to the show. Um, obvious, uh, Oddly enough, she ended up on the on the gigantic boards in her little red devil costume and had the time of her life. Yeah, absolutely. And I always tease her about, oh, I had to beg you to come to see right. the Rolling Stones, you know. Yeah, right. The deal is it's probably a requiem for the devil, right? Yes. He was singing at the time and he flash onto her and she's in her devil's yeah. outfit, right? I thought, you know, not I, a lot of people would have given their eye teeth. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And so what were the kids doing? Well, uh, my oldest daughter has a real job. She uh, teaches French and Spanish. Wonderful. Uh, in the North Kansas City School District. Wonderful, And has yeah. been a school teacher, and she's great. And um, Ari has always worked in hospitality, so she's always moving around someplace. They are in Kansas City. And That's, then... Uh, two. Yes. And then my son, uh, Wyatt, on his first day in L.A., when he had just graduated high school, came out for a visit. I 
honestly, I think he was laying on the couch in my apartment playing video games. Of course. We were getting ready to do the Grammys, and they needed a runner, and I couldn't find a runner. And I said, Wyatt, well, actually, his name at that time was Gregory. That's his name. Mm -hmm. I said, "Um, I'm going to ask you to come over and be a runner for the Grammys for back of house. He's like, well, you know, I don't really know my way around Los Angeles. And I said, pretty much everything is in the building. So he comes over and he introduces him to to everyone. And where are you from? He said, oh, I'm from Kansas City. And they said, oh, like Wyatt Earp. And that day he became Wyatt. And Wyatt said, well, Wyatt Earp's really from Kansas. <laughs> But they called him Wyatt the whole time. We're we're not going to get into geography here. (laughs) And the guy came up. He goes, I really like Wyatt. He's a good kid. He's he's doing great. And I said, who is Wyatt? (laughs) (laughs) And so from that day forward, he worked the Grammys, and then he stayed. He had been with AEG for 18 years. He he ended up in the King's ticket office. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I came to open Sprint Center a few months later, he came and uh, set up the manifest and everything for Sprint Center and opened the wow. building, did the whole Garth thing and all of that. It was uh, so he's he's been working for his mom. Gosh, that's awesome. And so he that's decided so <clears throat> it was probably time for him to spread his wings. And I'm not quite sure he's been in. He's worked security. He's worked yeah. uh, a lot of things for a lot of different companies. Uh, my friend Sean Hunter, who I told you about, yeah. uh, bought a minor league baseball team in Chicago. It's called the Chicago Dogs. They plays in, play oh, in like Rosemont. That. On the hot dog. Yes, yeah. that's a great name. So uh, yeah. Wyatt went up and helped him get set up. It was a new stadium, a new, you know, hey, we're getting things going. And Wyatt went up and worked a couple summers up wow. there. So, yeah. That's awesome. Following the path. Yeah, I would have tried about your husband. Well, he... Worked in the same industry. Yeah, right. And so for a long time, he uh, worked for a seating company and a staging company out of Clare. Perfect. Michigan. Perfect yes. union there, yeah. So he traveled a lot, uh, installing seats in new buildings, uh, putting up, putting together stages for that were going out on tour. Sure. Uh, going places, problem solving where the stage was... They said the stage wasn't level, but really, and it was an old arena. It was the floor that wasn't level. Uh, so he did that up until about five years ago. And, you know, after um, 9-11, it just got hard to travel. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it just kind of wore him out, and he had to take all his tools with him, and you know, yeah, it was kind of one yeah. of those. And it was at that point where I was like, oh, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So... What do you, before we talk about Kansas City, we'll just talk about KC here in a minute. I think you've given us, I know how you feel about it, obviously, from what we've been talking about. But what do you guys do for fun? What do you, what do you do? What do you do just, where, where do you go? You know, like, what do you do for fun? Well, it's kind of, it's really crazy because we like to take road trips. And so anytime Greg and I would take a road trip, We'd say, oh, you know, we when we we drove from L.A. to Kansas City a few times, and when we get to Phoenix, we'd go, let's go check out the new football stadium. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> let's go check out the new arena they've got going Can't on. Can't get out of your blood, <laughs> can you? Hey, there's a really cool theater. I hear they're doing this where most people are going to see museums or, you know, the Grand Canyon or whatever. It's like, oh, man, did you hear this new sound system they yeah, have? Right. So, yes, it was in our blood. I think, you know, now that I'm at home more, what do I do for fun? A couple of weeks ago, I got to sit on my sofa, watch <laughs> everything from the beginning of the red carpet to the last award given at the Grammys. Okay. And I was in my jammies and robe, and I had some popcorn and some wine, and I was just thinking... I'm so comfortable because if I had been there right now, my feet would have been killing me. I would have been ready to to leave. So it's just kind of fun. I did watch the um, People's Choice Awards last night. drove me crazy. I said, I can't figure out what building they're in. So I had to look it up, and they were at the Santa Monica Air um, in the barn out there. But, yeah, I, I love watching it on TV. Sure. Loved watching the the hockey game yesterday from a stadium. I kind of look at it from a different perspective. 
Uh, what do I do? I Yesterday, I think I was jonesing a little bit because there was no Chiefs football on. Oh, yeah. You're going to yes. have to wait a while. Yes. Yeah. So we always have someone. We always host Chiefs Sunday. Sure. Or whatever night they're playing, the family comes over and, yeah. Uh, that's absolutely wonderful. And so I, I think I we probably covered it, but I, th- we always say there's just something about Kansas City. What is it for you? I know it's home, but what is it about this place that's so special? You know, I... I think it's it is the people, mm-hmm. but it's very authentic. It's not smoke and mirrors. We're not fake, and it's not uh, people here for the most part are very friendly and caring. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a certain amount of quiet philanthropy that goes on in Kansas City. Mm-hmm which amazes me when I hear about the donations and the numbers and the people coming together. But we're not braggadocious about it. It's just kind of let's roll up our sleeves and get in there and and get done whatever needs to be done. And and then, you know, we do the hard work, but we also we also know how to throw a party. Oh, yeah. And we enjoy it. And I think there's just something that's very heartwarming about that. And people invite you in. I have seen, I have guests who have come to Kansas City and they're in their whatever jersey they're wearing from another another <laughs> team. But when they go to Arrowhead or to the Royals, even though they're not for the same team, they always tell me, gosh, everybody asked where we were from and how our team was doing. And, you know, it just wasn't confrontational. Right. And, um, and of I course, th- we're going to kick your butt, but that's okay. Yeah, we love yeah. you anyway. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. we we just love you. Well, Brenda, I can't thank you enough for coming in and, and spending some time with us. And the, and the other thing is, is as I think on it a little bit, I'm not sure what downtown would be without the Sprint Center, without the T-Mobile Center. I'm oh. just not sure where we would be in this city without it. Like, say, we knocked Kemper down and put it back down in the stockyards or whatever we do. I'm just not sure where we would be in this city without having that building as the epicenter of those types of events that we're doing in Kansas City. Well, so. you know, I I am very proud of Sprint Center. I'm very honored that Kansas City allowed me to come home and, you know, have that time at Sprint Center and right. T-Mobile Center. I've loved every minute of it. The people I worked with, our sponsors, I mean, people in downtown – it's just, um, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Now, I, I can't wait for downtown baseball now. Yeah, here you go. Here There's we go. One more th- you know what? There may not be downtown baseball ever considered without the Sprint Center. We don't know that, <laughs> where it is and where it's, and what it, and what developed around it. For all of a sudden, hey, being right across the street won't be such a bad idea. So it's just great. Brenda Tennant, you're just terrific. We thank you for everything you've done for this city, and uh, you're one of the reasons. There's just something about Kansas City. Thank you, Brenda.